And as I just said before I started the recording, um, thank you all for joining us for the uh, workshop today on supporting underprepared students in your courses. I am Dr. Lindsay Reland. My pronouns are she, her, and y'all can call me Lindsay. And I am an inclusive teaching coordinator for CIDL here at NIU. Let me turn off my little face. I have too many screens. Um, okay, so today we're going to um, we're going to be talking about strategies to assess students' knowledge base and their readiness. Um, we don't know what they need to know until we figure out what they already know. Um, so we can't assume that anybody's walking into our classroom with knowing X, Y, Z things. Um, so we need to do some sort of assessment to, to see where they are and individual students in our classes might be at different, uh, preparedness levels. So we need to sort of figure out where everybody is. Um, we're going to be talking about methods for, uh, providing that, uh, providing assessments, materials, and opportunities to support our students. Um, we're going to talk about techniques that we can do to enhance the overall learning experience. And we're gonna talk about uh, creating an inclusive learning environment so that students can be successful regardless of their uh, level of preparedness for our classes. And I will say, um, I have these workshops you know, regularly and people uh, come in and they say, I'm already doing that. I'm already doing that. So some of these things might not be uh, completely brand new. Um, I'm sure most of you all have been teaching for a while, um, if not, you know, over a decade. And so uh, whether you are doing things intentionally because you know that it's going to help with students that are underprepared um, or it's just good practice, or it's intuitive based off of what your uh, students seem to need. Some of you all might be doing this, but uh, just know that a lot of this stuff is like actually couched in uh, good practices, not just um, something that you uh, maybe felt out, but you're not sure if that's what you should be doing or if it's the best way forward. Um, so I, first I want to address that uh, it feels like a lot of students are just underprepared and um, we've been talking about it a lot, especially after um, online learning that was sort of pushed across the board because of the pandemic. Um, but this gap has been widening um, between our expectations for college level skills and the skills necessary to graduate high school, this gap has been widening for a while now. So this is not um, super new, but it maybe feels uh, more recent because um, there was a dramatic shift in uh, the way that learning happened because of the pandemic. Um, but part of this shift uh, in students not being prepared for the college classroom um, is because we're having more students than ever and more students, I should say, from diverse uh, backgrounds than ever in our classrooms. So these students might not have been prepared to come to college. They might be first generation, so they um, don't necessarily have people um, within their immediate family that can help them prepare. Um, they might come from low income areas where the schools might not have as much funding for AP classes or for them to dual enroll um, or to work on um, skills in a way that doesn't just meet the state requirements. We might have students that are English language learners, um, which is not to say that 
they're coming in with a deficit, but it's uh, another layer of uh, preparedness that they need in order for, to work in a language that um, isn't their primary language or is a language that they've only, you know, sort of recently learned um, and they're expected to be proficient in in order to get this degree. Um, we're seeing more students that are neurodiverse, uh, students that are returning or they're from historically marginalized communities. So they might not necessarily have the support uh, that other students would have in their homes or within their communities or within their schools. Um, when we have returning students, if you've been out of the classroom for a while, if you're not using those skills, sometimes it's um, you can you can get back to them, right? If you haven't been writing five page papers um, regularly for 10 years, doesn't mean that you can't get to back to that skill, but it might not be something that you're actively practicing. So it might take you a minute to uh, get used to that versus a student that maybe came out of an AP uh, prep course for, um, you know, writing or whatever English literature and might have those skill sets like it might be more immediate for them to access that information and to work on that. Um, and I will say, and some of us uh, in this space already know, uh, colleges don't and can't require courses devoted to prepping students for college level work. So the way that it works out with funding um, we can suggest students take courses that help them prepare for, uh, for classes, right? We can suggest that they take um, a, a math class that will help bridge them from what they were doing in high school to what they were expected to do um, in college level geometry. We can uh, suggest that they take um, a reading comprehension course or an intro to uh, college writing course that is not required. Um, and some universities offer those things, some of uh, universities don't, um, but we can't make them do that and pay for that if it doesn't fit the requirements of the university. So there's also some interesting things going on with that where they're not, um, students aren't getting the support that they might need in the college classroom in order to meet the requirements or to uh, go those couple steps up to the classes that are required. Um, yeah, um, Ellen, I know you're all too familiar with with all of that. Um, and it's uh, helpful for students to not have to pay for things that aren't meeting the requirements for programs. Um, but it's also uh, frustrating for them to not have those, uh, those classes available to them or to have that individualized support, um, which means that some of us might have to do a little bit more um, legwork, put in a little bit more effort to get students to where they need to be. Yeah, baby bathwater situation, exactly. Um, I do want to say that students feel underprepared too. So um, they're not walking into classrooms and uh, shocked <laughs> that they're they're not where they need to be. But there's a lot of reasons why students that are academically and emotionally underprepared for college might still be here. Um, so it's something that they might lack resources. So they uh, don't have housing security and they need a place to stay. So it makes sense for them to come to college now. Um, they might have a lack of support at home or within their community. So they don't know how to navigate systems and spaces. I mean, we see students that literally don't know how to navigate the space of the university. They don't know which buildings they can be in. They don't know how they can be using uh, the library. All of these things are, um, are new to a lot of students. And so if we aren't giving them that information or um, answering those questions when they come up, they're at um, a disadvantage, right? 
And there's also this sense of urgency that's pushing a lot of students into college classes now. If they don't use the scholarships and the opportunities that they have now, they're not going to go to college. And as we know, there's been um, a big push in the last 20, 25 years, maybe 30 years, um, telling us that if we don't go to college, then we're not going to get good jobs. And so for some people, that remains true for uh, the field that they're going in. They're going to have to get a college education. And if they can have uh, scholarships and things available to them now, then they're going to do it. So um, students aren't necessarily feeling ready to come to college, but they're doing it because uh, it's sort of a now or never thing. So one way to uh, start off this understanding of um, our underprepared students is trying to assess their prior knowledge oops, and uh, provide resources for that. So if we can use early ungraded assignments and have conversations with our students to check in with their level of readiness. So in the writing classroom, we um, frequently will have them, you know, write a little bit of something about themselves. Sometimes I'll have them write me a letter and tell me about their uh, experience in the writing classroom, uh, what they're pursuing for their degree, that sort of thing. And then I can see a little bit about them and I can also see like maybe what writing skills that they have or um, things that they might be struggling with. You can also ask them directly, have them fill out a survey um, and say, how do you, do you think that you know how to uh, write a paragraph? What does that look like? Um, are you familiar with the concept of uh, biological sex versus gender? Sort of figure out um, what they think they know. And if it's something where uh, it's ungraded and even anonymous in some situations, students will answer honestly. Um, but unless you ask those questions directly, they might not know what they don't know or what they need to ask more questions about. Um, establishing core concepts and skills and sharing them early on is very, very helpful. So um, if you know that a research paper is going to be a part of your class, even if you're not um, teaching a writing class, talking to students up front about what the research process looks like, um, what does it mean to cite sources, here are resources that can take you through step by step, here's what I can do to help you, here's examples of this work. All of that is super helpful. Um, for those of us that actually teach uh, and use exams or quizzes, helping students uh, prepare for exams, showing them examples of what that's going to look like, how they might put together a study guide, um, stepping them or walking with them through all of those processes is really helpful. And I will say too that um, if we're teaching 100 or 200 level classes, we uh, often think, okay, these are first year uh, students or um, at least new students coming in and they might need a little bit more guidance. But the same thing can be true for our graduate students. They might be returning students, have been out of the classroom for 20 years. Um, the same thing could be true for students that are taking upper level uh, history courses or um, psychology courses, what have you. Maybe they got to test out because of X, Y, Z reasons. Um, maybe they're returning uh, for their uh, degree and they've been not doing something for a while. Maybe uh, they were able to transfer credits from a community college and their curriculum looks different than ours. So if we can provide these sort of resources, um, if you can spend a little bit of time going over them in class, but also just having them in a resource library on your Blackboard, uh, providing specific time for students to come and visit you during office hours and say, okay, you know, this week I'm really going to focus on um, helping you all with your citation. This, I'm going to be available during these times, like let's come together and uh, work on our um, 
on our in-text citation or end-of-text citation or whatever, um, showing students where they can go for Writing Center or for other tutoring services on campus. Uh, they won't necessarily know uh, where those things are available, how they're available, and if we can normalize them using those things and not create a sense of shame around uh, making mistakes or uh, needing additional help, that's, that's huge. And if there's specific technology that you have to use for your classes, uh, take time to help people set up those accounts and uh, practice using them. I had students that didn't know that they had Word available to them for free. Um, they didn't know how to access things through um, the Microsoft suite online. They didn't know how to use the Adobe suite, things like that. So if you can actually spend time in class, and just project your screen and click through, show them where things are available, uh, send out links so that they can figure that out. It, you know, it seems sort of basic to some of us, um, but when you consider some of these students have never had to use um, office suites before, they've never used Word, they've always used uh, like Google Drive and Gmail and Google Docs. So there's a learning curve for all of these things. Um, even if they've used similar stuff, they might not know how to navigate the, the things that we have available to them for free. Um, having students that are supposed to meet with you via Teams, um, many of us had to navigate that recently where um, in the last couple of years, we had to get very used to using Teams or Zoom or Blackboard Collaborate students don't necessarily know how to use those things either. So if we can show them what that looks like before we're asking them to use those things, uh, that's very, very helpful. Even if our students are underprepared, we can help them feel better um, because we know that they're not going to be, uh, they're not gonna know everything automatically learning is a process and we have we need to be normalizing that process and making them feel good about um about learning because they're not going to hear something once and automatically remember it they're not going to practice something once and automatically be able to do that and we need to talk about that in our classes so um having growth mindsets and giving students opportunities to uh, practice things in class or to revise and resubmit things um, as they learn more, as they learn um, how to do things in a particular way. Maybe they had a challenge with uh, the software that they were using in order to answer questions on the exam, and so they didn't do well on the exam. Maybe uh, they forgot how to do a particular um, equation. Uh, Maybe they confuse two terms on their psych exam. Maybe uh, they forgot that they were supposed to do in-text citation on that paper. So if we give them an opportunity to get feedback on something and then revise and resubmit, maybe it's not for full credit, maybe it's um, for something else, but they can actually go back and work on those skills as opposed to getting maybe not a great grade and moving on and not actually uh, working on that skill um, in order to get better at it. Um, giving students clear and specific feedback on how to improve their work is really huge. Um, it takes time to uh, give feedback. That takes time out of our days. If we're teaching classes with um, 50 or more students in a particular section, that's a lot of time to dedicate, um, but that goes a long way. Um, we also should be acknowledging students doing uh, hard work. It's hard to learn. It's hard to be um, vulnerable and, and ask questions or um, to acknowledge that something that you're doing is not necessarily the best work possible. And so acknowledging students are, are out there working goes a long way too. Um, and again, leaving room for mistakes, whether it means that they get to resubmit something or they practice skills in class, um, they get low stakes opportunities to work on things um, is really helpful. And we need to sort of acknowledge that mistakes are part of the learning process. Um, 
and then I'm not able to sort of just dump knowledge into somebody's brain and they can do things perfectly. I think that uh, the grading system in um, K through 12 and in higher education, a lot of times uh, doesn't leave wiggle room for mistakes, but that's something that we may, we may need to uh, back up from and assess ourselves. Um, also providing opportunities for individualized attention. Excuse me. Um, so that might mean setting up one on one conferences. It might be uh, taking time during class for students to um, focus on specific tasks. And then you can go out around and give them individual attention or even say, work on this and you can come up and talk to me. Um, giving them uh, flexibility and adaptability for their needs and their life circumstances. Um, so acknowledging that they're not uh, just a number, another number in your class, that they have something coming up um, that they need to be missing class or they need extensions on or whatever. Um, acknowledging that that's uh, important, that they're people and working with them as much as possible. You could also do, um, as I mentioned earlier, themed office hours where you say, OK, we're going to work on this specific thing. Um, we're going to work on our um study guides for this or we're going to practice this particular um function or whatever it is and so students can know that they can step in for uh that particular thing if they need guidance um and it normalizes that people are having challenges with that but it also gives them a, an opportunity to come and talk to you one-on-one -on -one in a situation that is um comfortable I also uh, really recommend sharing examples of your work. Um, so what would a paper for this class look like? What does a project for this class look like? Um, what would the study materials look like? What does the test look like? It doesn't have to have uh, answers for the class, but OK, how is that exam set up? Um, when you're talking about how things are going to be laid out. OK, first section is short answers. And this one is, uh, this thing is uh, writing paragraphs or whatever. What does that actually look like? And give students like something to visually look at and go through with you so that they have a little bit more of an understanding of, of how to study for that. Um, and they can feel more prepared for that individual assignment. Sharing and, and using uh, learning techniques and studying techniques in the classroom is also very helpful. Uh, some of us are going to have more time in the classroom with students than others. And if you have the opportunity to use like the Pomodoro technique, um, that's a great opportunity to uh, do in-class work and break up the time in class so that students can focus on being productive and you can sort of model that for them. So um, whether you want to do uh, like 15 minutes of work and then you know a five minute break or 20 minutes or whatever, um, giving students an opportunity to hyper focus on something and then take a break from it and you can sort of talk about it as a class. Okay, so um, you were reading about this thing, what kind of notes did you take? Um, what questions do you have based off of um, the things that we read about learning in the brain today? Um, and sort of dividing that up, but also demonstrating to them that this is like a study technique that they can use um, effectively on their own. Uh, using retrieval practice, and retrieval practice is something that we um, maybe commonly used in the classroom, but also students can use it on their own. So trying to recall information using quizzes or brain dumps and reflections to enhance learning. So that could be something that you uh, give a quiz at the beginning of the class to see what students remember from the previous class or what they uh, collected from their readings. Um, you might have them do brain dumps after a class session um, 
and just sort of stream of consciousness writing like what all do you understand now about um oh yeah carrie so brain dump is yeah stream of consciousness writing essentially um you might give them a prompt to say like what all are you taking away from class and it doesn't have to be um formal writing it doesn't have to like there's no punctuation needed or anything but they're essentially just uh writing out or typing out whatever they want to do um everything that they're taking away from uh, a particular conversation or everything that they know about something so you might have them do a brain dump before you uh start a project okay what is everything that you know about um uh intersectionality um or after watching a video or after talking about something in class you might have them uh do the same type of brain dump so what did you learn today what do you know about this thing now um so that they can walk out understanding what they actually know what they actually took away um and then you can also use brain dumps so you can sort of have like free writing about you know what did you learn today for five minutes and then you can check in with your students at the end of that and see what things they came up with um you can also have them write reflections to think about uh their progress and their process um what did you learn after writing your persuasive paper how do you think that uh will fit into what we're going to be doing with um with our research writing in the future uh how do you see um how did you use your time when you were working on this assignment what would you do differently in order to make sure that you had enough time to go to the writing center in the future or um, plan to participate in um, peer revision sessions or whatever that might be. So these are opportunities for students to directly say what they understand, um, possibly what they're confused about, um, but also acknowledge their learning process and their work process and sort of reflect on that as well, because that might be something that they need to address. It might not be necessarily that they don't completely understand um, the assignment or the material. It might be that they didn't give themselves enough time in order to demonstrate that. Yes um reflections work so well in first year composition um but they work so well i think in a variety of classes i think they it lends that type of writing lends itself especially in a writing classroom um and then you can uh you know get them to uh write more and think critically about their process um but it also works in a variety of other classes where they're working on projects, where they're working on um, maybe uh, working together with other people. Um, what were those dynamics like? What, what did we learn about ourselves as individuals or about our learning process? It gives students a chance to be sort of meta in ways that maybe they're um, not willing to do on their own. Um, because if students are underprepared, um, well, if, when students learn, I should say, when students learn, they need to be aware of their learning process um, in order to tap into that as much as possible in order to be successful. So if we can um, encourage them to sort of reflect on not only um, the skills and and the knowledge but also their process of learning and what they're doing that's effective and what they could do to be more effective with their time um that's that's super helpful um and then also using concrete examples of when we're teaching them things so uh again in in the writing classroom we often will say okay we're going to work on something that's persuasive. This is when we might be uh, we we might want to be persuasive in our writing 
or in our communication in the future. Um, you're trying to convince um, the festival to give you your money back based off of the experience that you had. Um, so here's how we might set up that uh, persuasive argument and make sure that we are um, communicating effectively and providing examples, et cetera. Um, so if we can sort of situate the things that we're learning about into ways that it's relevant to our life outside of the college classroom, that can be really helpful. And sometimes it'll be, you need to learn this in order to use this in the field. Um, and that's okay. But also, if we're talking about something in geometry, is that going to help with uh, students that are going to be doing DIY stuff in their houses in the future? Um, how can we situa situate this knowledge so that it's not so abstract and not so big um, and feels more uh, tangible and uh, relatable for students? With all students, um, we need to make sure that they're given an opportunity to speak up, but especially underprepared students, um, we really need to normalize that it's it's okay to feel behind, it's okay to um, have questions, to not be perfect, um, it's not embarrassing. And so uh, if we create an environment where students can um, speak up and ask those questions, then they're going to have a better opportunity of, of being prepared um, when they come to the next class or, you know, getting to a satisfactory level with that skill that they're working on. So giving them platforms and opportunities to ask questions about content and skills, that might be um, anonymous spaces on um, on like the Blackboard discussion boards, you might allow them to post questions anonymously. Um, you might give them an opportunity to work in groups where they can come up with, um, okay, I just introduced this new assignment in your groups, come up with three questions that you have about this new assignment. Um, or, you know, after you, if you're gonna meet with them for one-on-one -on -one conferences, have them prepare two questions to uh, to ask you when they meet with you. Um, creating a class environment that welcomes student questions is also very important. Um, something that I've heard other people do is um, when you're talking about something, introducing new information, uh, to say, what questions do you have? Or um, what are some things that I can uh, add clarity to instead of saying, do you have questions? Uh, do you need information? So it's just sort of like uh, normalizing in just the way that we phrase it, that questions are normal. I, I probably uh, need to give you more context or maybe this wasn't clear. That's okay. I'm um, I'm imperfect, and the way that I present information is imperfect, and um, you're not challenging me by uh, wanting clarity or um, proving to be uh, um, underprepared or that you're not at the level that you should be if you have questions or, or need examples or me to slow down. Um, and also providing multiple means for communication can be really, really helpful. Uh, having in-person meetings, um, as I said before, virtual meetings, email, Teams messaging, uh, anonymous uh, Q&A sections on a Blackboard discussion board is all helpful. Um, some of us don't want students to uh, Teams message us, and I think that's OK. Um, but it's another way that students might feel more comfortable and feels like a little bit more informal that students might feel uh, good about reaching out to you that way. Um, it's also challenging for students having so many different platforms to uh, 
talk to people, it feels, I think, sometimes overwhelming and feels very formal. So if you can normalize having those conversations, if you can reach out to students via email and create uh, an email thread that they'll feel comfortable just replying to instead of actually having to generate that first email, sometimes they need that. Um, and then when students have questions, it's helpful to share those questions with other people and share the answers um, and really normalize like that's a great question or yeah, I can clarify that more. Um, so if you get an email with a question addressing that somebody asked this question uh, via email between our class periods, I want to talk about it for a minute. Um, at the beginning of this class, because I want to make sure that, you know, it's addressed. Um, something that I tell my students all the time is that if one person asks a question, usually five other people are thinking about it. Um, and sometimes they might not know how to formulate the question or they might think that it's silly. Um, but if they need the clarity, it's, it's never silly, right? Um, so if you can post those things on uh, Blackboard have a frequently asked questions section or address it in class or send out an email to everybody. Um, if you feel like it's really important to address that before you meet again, those are all great ways to acknowledge that questions are important and that having that information is important too. Um, and if you can uh, give them more depth and uh, answer them in um, in a way that answers their question, but also gives them um, opportunity to seek out further information. That's very helpful. Students ask questions that are on the um, that are answered in the syllabus or the assignment sheet all the time. Um, I always say, I always directly answer them, and then I refer them back to the document that has more information. Um, to let them know, like, I did answer this, it's in this space, but um, so if you need more information about that, this is where this lives. Um, but I and never respond, just check this thing. I always answer it um, kindly and, uh, and directly because I want to make sure that, um, you know, they're, they're getting the answers to their questions, but they also don't feel... Uh, afraid to ask questions in the future. They don't feel silly about it, um, which it's frustrating sometimes, you know, to have the same questions over and over and over again that have been addressed in other spaces. But we also have to keep in mind that students have so many, uh, so many Blackboard pages, so many syllabuses, so many assignment sheets to sort of sift through, and they're not necessarily going to remember where everything exists. And if they are unfamiliar with what a syllabus is, um, or if they prefer to have a printed out assignment sheet in front of them. And so it's hard for them to remember where things exist. Um, we can do some things to uh, make that a little bit easier on them and to help them learn how to navigate those things in the future. Um, and when students say that they need something, uh, I believe that uh, we should honor it. <laughs> I think that underprepared students, if they're able to state what they need, um, which again, can be something that is embarrassing or can be a moment of vulnerability for them. Um, if we can honor that need as much as possible, that's great. Or explain why you can't is also uh, very useful. If they need extra time to work on something um, because they just figured out how to uh, go to the writing center and get assistance on um, citations um, because they didn't know that they could go into the physical library and check out books, um, which might seem like a silly thing for me to say, but I've, I've actually had students that didn't know that they could go to the library and check out books. Um, they thought they could only use online spaces and um, no one had explained to them how to use the library. So that was a big learning process. 
And so a lot of time um, sort of slipped through their fingers because they didn't know that they could do that. And they needed more time to work on something because of that. Um, or maybe their technology isn't working and they didn't know that they had access to computers in specific spaces on campus. Um, so if we're able to honor that and give them more time or give them um, access to particular resources, um, that's amazing. If you can't do that, um, just tell them why. Don't just deny a request. Um, and again, that'll help them feel better about asking questions, about um, requesting assistance, and really helps uh, break down the barrier that um, that their instructors aren't approachable or that um, they can't um, ask questions or you know be humans with needs in the college classroom. Um, which I think a lot of students feel like that. We're, they're told um, in high school, well, you can't do that in college. They're never going to work with you like this. Um, you need to figure this thing out before you get to college because this doesn't work. Um, and they're often surprised when people are willing to have conversations with them um, and uh, address their needs. So let's make sure that we are our... Uh, Acknowledging that, again, maybe we can't honor everything. Maybe they need an extension beyond um, the end of the semester. Maybe they uh, didn't turn things in um, after their extension. Maybe we can't work with them in particular ways, but acknowledging that um, they have needs and that it's not um, inappropriate to ask for things is, is huge. Um, as I mentioned before, students don't necessarily know how to uh, navigate the spaces on campus, and they don't necessarily uh, know how to use the community. Um, so if you have ideas about uh, good spaces for quiet work on campus or um, have other students that you know have suggestions, share those in class. Um, you can encourage students to uh, work in study groups or arrange them for them. Um, not everybody is gonna have time on campus after class um, and that's okay, but uh, giving students an opportunity to work with their classmates or to work with you in informal settings to, uh, to study or to work on classwork is, is really helpful. Um, I've had students that just want to uh, do uh, parallel work. And so I've just set them up in my office with me during my office hours and they work on their work. I work on my work and they don't even really want to talk to me. They just want a quiet space to do that. And they want an opportunity to ask questions as they come up. Um, and so that's a pretty small thing for me um, to do to provide that. You could also do virtual spaces where you just have a, a a room open on Blackboard Collaborate where people can pop in and out and ask questions or just um, quietly work on something for an hour in a space where you're available to them. Uh, showing students where tutoring services are on campus, so walking them over to the Writing Center, uh, helping them sign up for something, uh, scheduling a visit from a tutor or even um, the a director or coordinator from a tutoring service is really helpful. Um, letting them know what to expect and how to prepare for those appointments is also very helpful. And if you can, at the very least, normalize asking for help and going to use those services, um, but also if you can incentivize those in some ways, uh, that's also great. So maybe if they're going to revise and resubmit something, um, an element of that is either meeting with you one-on-one -on -one or meeting with a, a tutor one-on-one -on -one and having a conversation about it before they resubmit. So um, after saying all of that, I would love to give you all an opportunity to uh, share your experiences or ask questions. Um, if you have questions, I'm I'm happy to 
answer things or uh, float it out to the group to answer. But I'm also curious, what are some ways that you've supported underprepared students? Um, or if you were an, an underprepared student yourself, what are some ways that you were supported? Um, and if there are particular challenges that you've encountered when supporting underprepared students. And you can either type in the chat or turn on your mic. Yeah, go ahead, Ellen. Um, very helpful, Lindsay. Am I unmiked? Can you can you hear you me? You are. I can hear you, yeah. Okay, good. Um, not all of my students, but I, I have you know a good number of students that really work better with print, like the syllabus yeah. or like an assignment sheet. And yet, that's a real problem because um, increasingly, <laughs> The university is pretty draconian about printing, and I understand that for budget reasons and environmental reasons, but my students have even fewer resources in that regard, so to ask them to print is tough. <clears throat> I have been using the department risograph because, you know, that's a, a lot cheaper. Um, anyway, that's, that's an issue that I do have students saying, can we just have paper? which is interesting because you would think they would have during COVID particularly normalized online stuff, but I do find that that's an issue. Any ideas about that? Um, I'm actually not super surprised that there are students that, um, that feel that way. I think that in some ways it becomes less abstract um like that they have an assignment if they actually have something physical in front of them um also it it can be helpful for students that are um neurodiverse uh to have a reminder that they have stuff to do if it's physically in front of them um yeah i think that that's an interesting uh problem to sort of encounter i don't know that i necessarily have any um real solutions unfortunately i definitely think that if you can um have a specific number of students that you're printing things for like that um is helpful rather than planning on printing for everybody if you have you know the same five people want things um i also wonder and i'm just speaking off the top of my head i would have to look it up but I also wonder for students that have um, accommodations through the DRC, if there is particular funding for students to get prints through them, um, which might be another option. But I, yeah, it's. I think that's a good go idea. But I don't think there's any, in, you know, anecdotally, I don't think there's a correlation. It's not really students that um, need accommodations, just it's sort of idiosyncratic. They just want paper, you know, and so, sometimes it's my very best students too. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely consider that DRC thing and I'll keep thinking about it too, Lindsay. It has been a great, um, great warning of ideas. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I think that um, that's such an interesting, um, interesting problem that we're we're coming across right and um it's very frustrating because um students just don't have that resource and it's expensive and for some classes they're required to print things so they're trying to save money in particular ways but um yeah i appreciate you bringing that up ellen um let me see carrie says i struggle with attendance and late work i have flexible due dates but i've struggled with students not attending or participating um, but then when to turn in their work at the end of the semester. I think um, that's a really common problem, Carrie. Um, and I think there are a couple different uh, ways that people approach this. Um, some students are going to be working at a level that maybe is, uh, that they're going to be successful whether or not they come into your classroom. Um, and so some people might make um allowance for that and allow them to turn in things at the end of the semester whether or not they've been physically in the classroom um 
but I mean, there's certainly ways where if you build in that you want them to be uh, attending, you could do uh, particular coursework or um, require them to meet with you X amount of times um, in order to uh, get approval on their research project or whatever it is. Um, but it has to be so baked into the class um, to really incentivize students to like continue to do that um, and continue to show up. I struggle with that a lot because I um, don't want to uh, require students that have uh, mobility issues or physically it's difficult for them to be on campus. Uh, I don't want them to be put in a situation where they uh, are losing points or losing, you know, uh, part of their grade because of that, um, because sometimes you end up in a class that you end up in it and you uh, it doesn't really meet your needs, but you're trying to be a full time student. And so um, that's something that I continue to have problems with, Carrie. Um, but I think if as much as possible, if you can sort of um, create opportunities for them to work with others and have coursework that is important, but not um high stress uh that's uh possibly a great way of doing that yes 100 percent, carrie 100 percent. i think that's something that i uh that i struggle with too and i um from the first day of class it's in my syllabus that um, I'm also a person and I also deserve to eat and sleep and uh, walk my dog. And so I have requirements about deadlines because of that, because if everybody's shoving things into my inbox at the end of the semester, um, I can't physically get through all the grading before grades are due. Um, so I think that having those uh, conversations with, with students outright is, is really important. Um, and I mean, some students will still try to push back on that, but um, if we have multiple drafts and conferences and in-class writing and they still don't participate, I, yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, definitely a difficulty. And I think that some of that comes down to the expectations, like the curriculum. Um, and talking to um, your your director about should they be doing X, Y, Z things? Is it better for them to be in an eight week class or an online class or something? Um, and are there options for them to be in a class that better meets their needs if you're setting up your class for um, to meet different needs? Melissa says having makeup is absences with one page reflections. I like that idea, Melissa. Um, I uh, want to be mindful of the time that we have left and uh, not ask you to say after. But if you have uh, other questions or things that you want to bring up, I will be in this room for um, a while longer. And I just want to say thank you all for for joining me. Um, I am going to be sending out these resources. Um, in a little bit and uh, recording. Um, but thanks so much uh, for, for joining me and for having this great conversation. I appreciate you all so much. Uh, good luck in preparing for our classes. <laughs>